Um, as a, um, just to go, just to uh, connect up with the morning, uh, the, I think the last question was about uh, what do we do then, you know, if we don't, uh, if we don't know really what to do, uh, what do we do? <laughs> and uh, that's, a, I think, a very crucial question because uh, I think as uh, um, many of the people uh, speaking here uh, and uh, here, here present uh, would agree that uh, really something needs to be done uh, in the uh, NMIC countries, low and middle income countries, third world, they would like to call it. Um, I hope uh, what I'm saying, what I say, does um, indicate a bit uh, some ways in which uh, uh, one could do something or start doing things in different areas without, um, without knowing very much about what to do, actually. As a background to my talk, I'll start uh, with a quote uh, um, from Lawrence. Uh, now, how do I, I have to just change it, do I? Yes. There is a danger that focusing attention on mental health needs only serves to divert attention, uh, all right, uh, from more difficult social problems that demand political and economic so uh, solutions. Psychiatry may collude with those who benefit from the status quo, neutralizing political challenges by reframing problems as aspects of individual mental health and offering treatment to individuals who are, after all, expressing the pain of a system out of joint. Now, obviously, this could apply to any country, but particularly to areas like Sri Lanka, where there's been the conflict and there's a lot of uh, uh, um, uncertainties, and it's not really very clear why people are, um, you know, maybe it's not really clear how one identifies the causes of uh, distress, difficulty, even psychosis. Um, now, again, uh, uh, having done that, I'd like to um, relate a couple of anecdotes. You may have heard of uh, camps for promoting health, used, I think, for educating people about vaccination, treatment for TB, etc. All very commendable. NGO-operated camps on mental health have been held in several Asian and African countries, I believe, during the past few years. I know of one model used in Sri Lanka conducted by a British NGO. Initially, so-called community workers arrive in a village with short symptom checklists, which they use to identify people allegedly suffering from one uh, or other psychiatric illness. Then these people are invited to a camp where they are given a lecture by a psychiatrist outlining the remedies available for the different diagnoses and invited to partake of the drugs displaced on a, uh, displayed on a table or given by injection. In some places, I believe, follow-up camps are held too, to follow up for the usual reason, to see whether people are taking their medication. The second anecdote is about something that happened in Sri Lanka in 2009 when I was helping with a public meeting to promote the idea of community care. We discovered that a rival meeting supported by, a mental, by the Mental Health Directorate, this is a government directorate, had been arranged also on community care on the very same day, about a mile away. Later, I discovered what this was all about, because it was clearly in rivalry. An Australian NGO, which had li linked up with some local professionals through various means, had sent a team to promote a scheme they were proposing, which was to train people around the country in community care. This was an NGO that specialized in services for depression. And the training was essentially to teach people how to diagnose the illness of depression. A few weeks later, a local newspaper published its investigation into the NGO in Concerned. Although it was non-profit making, many of the people on its management were heavily involved in pharmaceutical companies. And some of the professionals on its board specialized in lecturing on behalf of these companies to promote particular antidepressants. Once this was exposed, the mental health directorate pulled out of the supporting this scheme. But otherwise, it was due to go ahead around the country, funded by, the, by this Australian NGO. This was aid. The third anecdote is about the UK and Bangladesh. A mental health trust in the UK discovered a few years ago that some British Bangladeshi people diagnosed with mental illness 
were being sent for treatment to Bangladesh by their relatives. Uh, when they inquired further, they actually sent someone over to Bangladesh to suss it out. They inquired further in 2011, last year, they found that, uh, among other findings, one of the community care facilities they were being sent to comprised a series of what the person uh, who visited the place described as warehouses, where they, these are the patients, were being given drugs appropriate to their diagnosis. Uh, drugs provided by a local pharmacy linked up with a drug firm. I leave you to ponder on these stories in the knowledge that in many low and middle income countries, there is no need for a prescription from a physician to buy drugs. One just has to know its name. In fact, marketing of diagnoses is equal to marketing of uh, drugs. And I remind you too of Derek's observation, among many others this morning, that uh, the so-called scaling up opens the door, or could open the door, to the big farmers marketing. Now my aim, uh, however, is to look uh, uh, in my talk at practical issues, if I can, of how the welfare of ordinary people in low-income countries can best be improved, focusing on this concept of mental health. <coughs> um, but mental health as understood by them, which varies from place to place, from locality to locality, often understood though as a holistic well-being, you might call it, rather than something located in the head, in the ment, in the mental, in the men's. Um, in one of its more enlightened publications, WHO states the following, that mental health refers to a broad array of activities directly or indirectly related to mental well-being. Uh, to the mental well-being component included in its uh, definition of health, which is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of a disease. In other words, mental health is wider than the absence of mental illness, however illness is defined. Further, the understanding of mental health and illness um, are largely determined by meanings people give to their experiences and feelings in the context of broader worldviews, about the nature of the human condition, much of which is culturally determined, that is, and socially determined. That is the culture and social environment of the majority of people, not particularly the culture of a particular professional group or an institutional group, which might be very similar to that in, uh, in other countries. Um, for example, feelings may be expressed in, in terms of idioms that reflect habits and traditions arising from culture that have become imbued with meaning through usage. Contextual factors and personal inclinations, the judgment of a particular idiom as normal or abnormal, adaptive or maladaptive, depending on sociocultural constraints held in society, and familiarity with alternative modes of expression. Illness experience is an intimate part of social systems of meaning and rules of behavior that are culturally constructed. And cultural variations in concepts of the person are reflected in meanings of health and well-being and mental health categories and concepts. Much of this is quoting from mainly uh, Lawrence. Um, now the context of development. The first thing to note is that whatever changes there have been culturally and in the use of language, the world of consumption, economic interests, and power politics still dominate the world scene. The players may be slightly di somewhat different, but it, this is still uh, very much uh, a factor. Although perhaps uh, dominate less overtly, more subtly than in the past. So we should try, so we should uh, be mindful that these forces, that's economic interest and power politics, affect, for example, what projects get funded or not, how research is conducted or not. And they put pressures on professionals to go in a certain way in determining, well, and in determining, finally, what sort of system emerges in a particular location. We need to be aware that power games are played out through world organizations subtly dominated by mainly interests of particular nations 
world organizations whose policies in implementation are often determined by experts they employ and the attitude of trainers going out from the first to the third world, whatever these organizations say in their official documents. Then there are the pharmaceutical companies, which use various means for developing markets for their products. Low priority being given for mental health development by many governments in LMI countries, and their consequent dependence <laughs> on NGOs that look to funding from agencies in high income countries, which sometimes work to their agendas rather than the real needs of people in LMI countries, with, uh, with uh, um, uh, the thinking that that's how they should do, set about things. <coughs> and finally, professionals are often still trained in styles of working, um, styles of working, uh, e.g. specialisms, more suited to developed Western locations, and so likely to go along with systems that may not suit the populations in their countries. Then there are the ground realities in uh, LMI countries that mental health development has to confront. Dr. Jacob in South India points out uh, that the importance of addressing poverty, public health infrastructure, and inappropriate training and brain drain are the most important. But it is equally necessary, I think, in the world of global capitalism to address some of the other items on this list. For example, the free marketing of psychotropic drugs against the background of whatever is sold as scientific and ostensibly Western get an easy run in the marketplace. And the pervasive low-grade corruption that leads to poor management of services, to say the least. Also, we have to address the fact that the most urgent psychosocial issue in some LMI countries concerns the disruption resulting from armed conflict natural and man-made disasters, and foreign invasions. Finally, what is striking to many people is the maltreatment of people who are disturbed in behavior, both in hospitals and in the community. Clearly, much worse in LMI countries than it is in the West, although it exists all over the world. Now, the process of mental health development. Development is a seductive word that suggests a necessary part of progress. In the post-colonial period, it implied both social improvement and catching up. But the discourse has moved on considerably since then, and much is made now of development, especially applied to LMI countries, development needing to be ethical and sustainable, unlike the ethos of development during colonialism. Ethical means that development is directly for the benefit of people of the country, regarded as self-defining subjects rather than objects of concern, which used to be the case. People entitled to choose their ways of life themselves, both as individuals and communities. And sustainable means it will carry on into the future, fitting into the mainstream of social and political structures without being dependent on ongoing input from other countries. In the colonial times, it was very different. It was development was to develop markets and to develop raw materials for the mother country. Now, the history of mental health development, very briefly, you all know this. We know that the imposition in colonial times of Western-type asylums did not really do much good and possibly helped towards the underdevelopment, if not the actual suppression, of indigenous systems of mental health care. Perhaps asylum should never have been introduced into LMI countries, but many still function in these countries and require urgent attention, not least to prevent human rights violations. But in planning more general services, we need to be careful not to make the same mistake we made about asylums, assuming that what is good enough for the West must be the best for everyone. One might call it the colonial attitude. Moreover, it is worth noting that serious doubts are being voiced today about the effectiveness of predominantly biomedical psychiatry in Britain and North America, especially in the, United, in the UK, for instance, for ethnic minorities of Asian and African backgrounds. Also, there are questions being asked in the US, for example, about the way medications are used in the frame of psychiatric models of illness, and about theories of, medical, of chemical imbalance 
of neurotransmitters in the brain. These are still minority voices in terms of power, but increasingly persuasive as e e exemplified by articles in New York Review of Books, New York Times, etc. And today's minority opinion could well be the established wisdom tomorrow. Like the asylum era, the current era, era of rigid diagnosis linked to specific individualized therapies may well be regretted before too long. So do we really want to risk getting the third world into this? So we have to be very wary indeed uh, of promoting rigid systems of diagnosis and thereby, I think, opening the door to markets, not just of pharmaceuticals, but various other therapies with a scientific tag. Now, the principles of mental health development in uh, uh, low-income low countries, developing mental health systems is not a simple matter of transferring established strategies commonly used in high-income countries. And mental health is not just a technical matter, but is tied up with uh, ways of life, values, and worldviews that vary significantly across cultures and societies. The basic principle of development is that we have to start by looking at what happens currently and work from there using what there is to start with. This is important, not just to ensure social and cultural relevance and ownership by the people responsible for sustaining these services, but also for cost effectiveness, using the least resources to achieve the greatest gain. In most LMI countries, a variety of services are accessed by people, but usually only if they can afford to do so. A list drawn up by Dutch psychologist uh, Beatrice uh, Wolf, um, researching in the central province of Sri Lanka not long ago, is an example. Clearly, the mix would be different in other places. Most people are pragmatic, often accessing more than one system, if they can afford it. And, their carers, uh, and if their carers are able to support them, for there is little or no support available from the state. Indeed, systems for supporting families may be one of the most effective ways of providing mental health care. Clearly, there is a role for foreign agencies, if only to kick uh, start with funding, and by demonstrating what happens in high-income countries that local people may wish to learn from. But it is important not to impose models of care that uh, lo local people find culturally alien or models that may be discarded in the West before long anyway. So where do we go from here? There's little hard data to go on uh, about the efficacy of systems of mental health care, whether indigenous or non-indigenous, religious, semi-religious, or medical, derived from Ayurveda, say, or African, or pre-Columbian, uh, ways of dealing with mental problems, systems which suffer from underdevelopment and not really being resourced very much now to, de to develop. Uh, and there is difficulty because problems that we see as being located in the mind, these problems are often seen in these cultures from a holistic standpoint, much broader than just illness. What is mental to us is beyond the mind-body split. Mental is out there, not just in here. Yet, there seems to be anecdotal evidence from user satisfaction about some indigenous therapies, spiritual therapies, remedies, and local knowledge that can be accessed if only we try without too much expense. And that perhaps should be uh, something that's done um, and wasn't uh, really recommended by the, the Delphi oracles. Recently, there have been a couple of uh, significant studies in prestigious Western journals articles by Raghuram and Halliburton, which I'll mention. Then there is the WHO um, IPSS, which you know was criticized he heavily, the methodology, for, being, uh, for not taking on board category fallacy, namely imposing the schizophrenia diagnosis as a measure of ill health. But surely we could take note of its finding that apparent, uh, how long? Okay, um, uh, uh, that apparent um, that the apparent outcomes for people who are seriously mentally ill were actually better in non-Western countries. It's just an indication, and uh, we should perhaps look into that. I know that most uh, recently, this better outcome has been questioned, and I suggest possibly because now, three decades later, 
psychotropic drugs are used more extensively than they used to be. And the model of schizophrenia, with its stigma and its image of genetic lifelong disability, has spread in many LMI countries with psychoeducation programs and other ways of imposing psychiatric uh, thinking. The paper in uh, the Raghuram paper, some of you probably know that well, uh, is uh, a Tamil Nadu Hindu temple, where, which was, uh, is well, was well known, uh, certainly still, uh, for healing people with mental health problems. And the authors elicited the views of both patients and carers before they went there and after. And uh, very briefly, what they uh, found was that uh, A, most of them suffered from what we would call psychotic illness. And they showed a degree of improvement uh, judged by psychiatric symptoms, again, a psychiatric assessment that matched the sort of results that may be expected through biomedical therapy. Halliburton's paper documented 100 people who had access treatment in three forms of therapy in Kerala, Ayurvedic, biomedical psychiatry, and religious healing at one of three locations, Hindu temple, Muslim mosque, and Christian church. All the patients could be diagnosed as schizophrenic. Uh, they all uh, ultimately benefited, but did so by shopping around. Some benefited from one, some from another. And um, in fact, I quoted this uh, article in, in the UK as arguing for user choice in our own British system. Once you gave a plurality and enabled users to, uh, to choose, then uh, ultimately the, the, the final outcome was very good. Now, taking all this on board, uh, what are the priorities? Uh, in uh, the McGill Trauma Global Health uh, Studies, um, which, which was not uh, developing mental health services, it was studying uh, the effect of the, the war and the tsunami on uh, how people saw their well-being. Uh, but we got this um, sort of in, 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 in information that these are the sort of stakeholders that should be, uh, should be uh, involved in many centers, not everywhere, in many places, as um, in a bottom-up uh, uh, work for developing uh, mental health uh, services for consultation with local con co communities. Um, I would think, uh, suggest that knowledge accumulated in psychiatry, especially the transcultural cultural variety, may well have a contribution to make, but in the present context, LMI countries should have some protection from unethical exploitation at the same time, perhaps some sort of watchdog to monitor activity of marketing and so prevent the sort of problems of drug overuse that we now see in, uh, in the US, for instance. Um, now, uh, I've only got a few minutes, so let me just change gear and, and go through this uh, uh, last slide very quickly. Um, I'm changing gear to address mental health development, not just for LMI countries, but for everyone, for universally. The world today is changing rapidly and uh, getting smaller call it westernization, globalization, whatever. Mixing of cultures, culture-based systems, becoming hybridized is inevitable, perhaps, and probably in the long run may be desirable. By hybrid therapies, I do not mean Ayurvedic uh, doctors slipping in phenothiazines into herbal mixtures, which they are alleged to do, uh, or CBT therapists extracting a technique from Buddhist meditation to, call, to attach it to CBT and call it mindfulness CBT. In the global scene of ethical development, we can have a give and take situation, one of learning from each other. There is room for interchange on equal terms based on respect, West and North learning from East and South, collaboration rather than imposition, true development rather than neocolonialism. The result may vary from place to place, there may be mixtures or maybe alternative systems existing side by side on a level playing field, giving service users, communities, and carers the choice. Personally, I would see the knowledge in transcultural, cultural psychiatry as uh, being, being quite important in uh, progressing this. But that means fighting off the much more powerful lobbies linked to biomedicine and, far, uh, and big pharma, promoting I suggest neo-colonialist imposition of systems into LNMI countries. And the great fear of the uh, global mental health movement um, is not the people involved in it, but actually that the system itself 
takes people into uh, a, a mode of uh, working that actually uh, merely results in opening up markets for market forces. Um, I was going to read uh, uh, the letter, uh, part of a letter that was uh, stimulated by the um, uh, publication in Nature that you may, many of you may have seen, but I won't do so because it really uh, emphasizes uh, what I've said. But it was a letter from, uh, from uh, grassroots, I think, which uh, I must say, you know, I, I had a hand in uh, trying to get it uh, going. But uh, it was from a, a community organization in India, a service user and a survivor organization, international one based in South Africa, and uh, um, a critical psychiatrist. Uh, network in uh, in the U UK, and uh, that uh, that indicated from talking to people that uh, there had not been any or much consultation with that sort of uh, uh, grassroots workers and service users and survivors. And I would have thought that is a very crucial element in a global mental health movement. I won't uh, get into the uh, conclusions, but just uh, stop there, see whether you have any questions or whether there is time.